Coming up on AFN, a story over six decades in the making. A story of Zeppelins and of jet aircraft. A story of sacrifice and of triumph. A story of compassion. And an awful lot of good. And of bravery. Rare historical footage and never before seen video bring to life the legacy of Rhineman Air Base. Rhineman Air Base, the U.S. military's gateway to Europe. For 60 years, it's been the home to countless airlift operations, medical evacuations, and high profile missions. Through the years, millions of military members arrived at Rhineman to begin their tours of duty in Europe. Countless others pass through in transit to support military operations such as Big Lift, Reforger, and Desert Storm, or perhaps to serve in Iraq and Afghanistan. No base in U.S. Air Force history has accomplished so much for so many years. One of the most historic American military bases, Rhein-Main Air Base, honoring a legacy. This is the deserted flight line at Rhein-Main Air Base. It's hard to imagine that this now empty patch of concrete was once the Air Force's busiest air base. Through the years, thousands of aircraft flew through Rhein-Main on their way to hotspots all around the world. But Rhein-Main was always more than just a place to park aircraft. It was also a heart and soul demonstration of America's commitment to protect democracy all around the world. Today's Air Force makes extensive use of high technology. But Rhine Mine can trace its roots back to the decidedly low-tech era of the Zeppelin. In 1933, the main source of air commerce in the Rhine Mine region was a small airfield at Frankfurt Rabstock. Because of the ever-increasing amounts of takeoffs and landings, a location was needed for a new airport facility near the city of Frankfurt. And in December of that year, German aviation officials chose Rhine Mine. Located just five miles from the Frankfurt train station and adjacent to the first German Autobahn, the site was ideal as a transportation hub. Growing up in nearby Dornbusch, USO volunteer Helmut Esser remembers very well the building boom that brought new ways of travel to the Rhine-Main region in the mid-1930s. The stretch from Frankfurt to Darmstadt, it was the first bit of Autobahn altogether in the whole of Germany. It was the start of it. And, uh, at the same time, we saw going up the big Zeppelin hangars, which were enormous. They were, well, I can't tell you how, how high they were, but they were all built up in an area where the Rhein Main Air Base terminal is now. What may have been the world's first true international airport, the Air and Airship Station Rhein Main, opened on July 8, 1936. The opening made the city of Frankfurt an important air transport hub. The industries, businesses, and banking in the Rhine-Main area also ensured a population that could afford the intercontinental Zeppelin passenger services. The airships, the LZ-127 Graf Zeppelin and the LZ-129 Hindenburg, made regular and profitable flights to both North and South America. This is Building 30 on Rhein-Main. It's one of the few buildings on the airbase still standing from the era of the Zeppelin. Now, in the 1930s, the Zeppelin was perhaps the most fantastic machine on the face of the earth. And seeing one with your own two eyes was the experience of a lifetime. The experience of seeing a Zeppelin fly overhead never left the mind of Wilfred Kallius. He first saw a Zeppelin as a young boy, and the sense of awe never left him. Today, he is the curator of a museum dedicated to the airships in the nearby town of Zeppelinheim. I'm from the west of our region of Germany, and that's also where I went to school. One morning in 1937, the teacher called all of his children out of the school to see a zeppelin that was flying overhead. We had to run a kilometer through the forest to a clearing, but then there it was, the zeppelin. It looked like it was about half as big as the forest itself. Zeppelins continued to carry passengers on their transcontinental flights until the ill-fated voyage of the Hindenburg to New Jersey in 1937. The doomed flight originated at Rhein-Main. The German government didn't want the crash to bring the Zeppelin's development to an end. So for a while, only cargo and mail were transported on the airships. But as time went on, official interest began to wane, and with World War II looming, 
the transport area and Rhine mine began to take on a more military atmosphere. Up until 1945, the German Luftwaffe, or Air Force, had control of Rhine mine. The base served mainly as a staging area for flights into the territory west of the Rhine River, primarily France. Although an occasional Messerschmitt ME-262, the world's first operational jet fighter, did land here, the base was never used solely for combat operations. However, things started to change after the liberation of France in the summer of 1944. The German army began pulling back toward its homeland, and the Allies began looking at Rhine Main as a strategic target to deny air support for the Germans. After three bombing raids between March and November of 1944, the Rhine Main installation was rendered almost unusable. Fifth Infantry Division soldiers took over a heavily damaged Rhine Main Air Base in March of 1945. Just two months later, in May, the Air Transport Command set up shop on Rhine Main. Because of security concerns, only military aircraft were initially allowed to land at the base. But eventually, the runways were open to commercial traffic. It was with the help of displaced German citizens, war refugees, that the airfield was repaired. Germans also built living quarters and maintenance hangars for the base's new occupants. And after repairs were finished on the northern part of the base, it wasn't long before regular civilian flights were taking off from Rhine Main. By September of 1947, various civilian airlines from around the world started using Rhine Main, providing regular flights to the United States, South America, Asia, and Africa. By the late 1950s, the airport was handling about 30,000 passengers a month. In 1959, the northern part of the base was returned to the Germans, becoming what is known today as the Frankfurt International Airport. With the transformation of U.S. forces in Germany in the early 1950s, Rhine Main Air Base became a major cargo facility. It was also around this time that Rhine Main began to take on a more community like appearance. More barracks were built. Clubs and mess halls went up to support the continuing number of units that were making Rhine Main their new home. By the 1960s, increasingly more U.S. soldiers arrived to Germany by air. They all flew into Rhine Main, making the base the gateway to Europe. Without a doubt, the Berlin Airlift stands out as the largest and most famous of the many missions to take place at Rhine Main Air Base. The Berlin Airlift not only fed the people of West Berlin, it also stemmed the tide of communism that was starting to wash over Eastern Europe. Over the span of 15 months, from June 1948 until September 1949, U.S. and Allied forces flew 2.5 million tons of food, coal, and other necessities into the blockaded city of Berlin. This old bird is the Douglas C-47. It was a mainstay of Allied air forces during World War II, and it also played a key role during the Berlin airlift. In fact, this airplane and another 400 very similar to it took part in an airlift mission called the Easter Parade. In one 24-hour period, Allied airmen flew 1,400 missions and 12,500 tons of supplies into Berlin. This display of resolve and military airlift capability broke the will of the Soviets. One month later, in May, they ended their blockade of Berlin, and the first battle of the Cold War was over. Operation Vittles will soon be on our The airlift was nicknamed Operation Vittles, and Rhine Main was one of four U.S. bases that had planes delivering rations into the war-ravaged city almost nonstop. For Bashir Mali, who was eight years old at the time of the airlift, the constant drone of Allied aircraft was a source of comfort. Especially I remember the planes when I were lying in my bed and started to sleep. Uh, as I came every one or two minutes, I heard a plane starting or landing. Uh, the, I felt that, that I'm sure. It's just the opposite uh, now to the problems of the airport here Rhine Main. The people say, oh, what a torture, every one minute one airplane. And I said, oh, what a good luck. 
By no means was the Berlin Airlift solely an Air Force venture. It was a joint effort of Allied forces and all the U.S. services to include the Navy and the Army. A lot of the goods were brought into ports in northern Germany by the U.S. Navy and then trucked into Rhein-Main by U.S. Army transportation units. My job was operation officer. Uh, we would um, have 40 trucks on line that go to the, to the uh, railhead, pick up supplies, and come back and line up. And then the, the Air Force loading uh, a sergeant would come pick up a truck, take it to the airplane, and, and load the airplane from the truck. Rhein-Main aircraft flew into Berlin at three-minute intervals, timed so perfectly, some say, because of the leadership on the base at the time. It was hard duty at Rhein-Main during the airlift with long hours and uncomfortable conditions. Lieutenant General William H. Tunner was the airlift's commander. His leadership skills kept the competitive atmosphere high, and his air crews set new records almost daily. He realized that it was a competition not only between the various units on the various bases, and it wasn't just the competition between Wiesbaden and Frankfurt here as to who could fly more tons in, you know, every day. But he knew there was a competition between our concept of freedom and democracy versus the Soviet Union who was, you know, trying to get us out. And he got it so that these planes were flying in and out and in and out every 90 seconds. Can if, you imagine? if you can imagine that. And when you figure some of the problems they got going on in, the, in flights today with all this technology, and here's a guy flying them in and out, forget the weather. Air Force 9758 Temple Hall, GCA, Final Control, Adam, can you hear me? Over. This C-54 Skymaster took the nickname of Rosinian or Raisin Bomber. The nickname comes from the sweet treats crew members delivered to Berlin's children during the airlift. The efforts that Rhein-Main Airmen took to brighten the lives of Berlin's children became a military operation all of their own. Operation Little Vittles was the brainchild of Lieutenant Gail Halverson. One of the most celebrated pilots of the Berlin Airlift was 21-year-old Lieutenant Gail Halverson, who was assigned to Rhein-Main after his tour of duty in the South Pacific. Following one flight into Berlin, Halverson met some German children that had gathered at the edge of the Tempelhof airfield. It was then that Halverson had an idea. He told the children he would drop candy from his airplane on his return visit to the city. The idea caught on, and Operation Little Vittles was started when Halverson's fellow pilots also got involved. And let me tell you a story that maybe describes that as best. One, one year I was at an air show here, and there was a big tall guy like myself, and he came up to Gail and he said, are you the candy bomber? And that guy said, yes sir, I am. And he broke down in tears, because he said as a kid, you gave me a candy bar and gave me hope. Unfortunately, the airlift was not without its dangers. 79 Allied pilots lost their lives during the operation. Years later, the Luftbrücke, or Airbridge Memorial, was dedicated to commemorate the sacrifices of the fallen airmen. 31 of the pilots were killed, Americans and crew members, and 39 of the British crew members were killed. They're the real heroes there. They gave their life for the freedom of the land. Two planes used in the historic airlift operation, a C-47 and a C-54, were put in place as a fitting reminder of Rhein-Main's key role in the Berlin airlift. The memorial now stands as a symbol of the base's history as a strategically located airlift facility. Due to its strategic location and airlift capability, Rhein-Main was also an important staging ground during the Cold War. In October 1963, Operation Big Lift, involving more than 16,000 soldiers of the 2nd Armored Division, brought troops to Europe in record time. Operation Big Lift was a graphic demonstration of the base's ability to support rapid troop reinforcement in Europe. In all, the base supported approximately 150 military exercises, with the largest being the return of forces to Germany, or Reforger, 
At the height of the Cold War, Reforger exercises proved America's commitment to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It also showed Soviet leaders America's ability to move conventional military forces quickly from the continental U.S. to Central Europe. It was Rheinmine's capabilities of handling such large amounts of equipment and personnel that made the annual exercise a success. The last reforger was held in 1993. Another role that Rheinmine played during the Cold War was being the point of return for numerous released hostages. C-9 military aircraft from the 435th Tactical Airlift Wing regularly flew from Rheinmine to pick up released hostages. The flights also returned Americans killed or wounded in terrorist attacks all around the world. In the mid-1980s, Rheinmine-based air crews flew hostages held by Lebanese terrorists to the base after their release from the cruise ship, the Achille Loro. The return of bombing casualties from the Marine barracks in Beirut in 1983, the victims of the 1986 disco bombing in Berlin, and the air medical evacuation of the wounded from the Navy ship, the USS Stark, in 1988, were all events that put Rheinmine squarely in the world spotlight. Unfortunately, Rheinmine Air Base was also the target of terrorist bombings. In 1976, a German leftist group bombing destroyed the base's officers club. And in 1985, a second attack here on this street in front of the base's headquarters had deadly consequences. The early morning blast killed a 19-year-old airman first class and a military spouse just as they were arriving for work. Several vehicles were destroyed, and the headquarters building received extensive damage. The Red Army Faction, another Germany-based leftist organization, took responsibility for the attack. The incident shook the Rhein-Main community, but ironically, it also reinforced ties with the Germans in the Frankfurt area, who had experienced a similar bombing some two months earlier. By the end of the 1980s, Rhein-Main had become the U.S. military's largest cargo and passenger facility in the world, with more than a million passengers passing through each year. This is, um, this is the gateway to Europe. So most, 90% uh, of all Army personnel that were coming to Germany, or at least coming to Europe, had to come to Rhein-Main in order to pass through here. Troops arrived at Rhein-Main and were processed through the 21st Replacement Battalion, which later became the 64th Replacement Company. Beginning in 1948 with the Berlin Airlift, Rhein-Main supported over 170 humanitarian operations. With the end of the Cold War, these missions became increasingly important. Rhein-Main once again stepped up to the challenge by providing much needed assistance by transporting tons of food and medical supplies all over the world. Operation Provide Hope combined U.S. and Soviet air forces to bring humanitarian aid to Russia. While Operation Provide Promise provided aid to the former Yugoslavia, that operation became one of the longest airlifts in U.S. Air Force history. We always just think of the Berlin airlift as, you know, being the only one that occurred here. But, excuse me, we, we provided airplanes with medicine to Egypt. Uh, we sent uh, food down to Italy during the floods. We, up to Hamburg when they had their floods, earthquake victims. Uh, you know, an awful lot of people on this earth, um, th you know, are thankful for the good services that were provided by the airmen out of this base in some way, shape, or form. These operations had service members at Rhein-Main working around the clock, building pallets of supplies, loading planes, and keeping the aircraft maintained and ready to fly. There was a real can-do spirit that ran through Rhein-Main airmen. The base had a well-earned reputation for doing whatever it took to get the mission done. You've got so many people that were willing, willing to, to go the extra mile, to volunteer the extra hours, the overduty time, whatever to make sure that those planes were finished and ready to go. Those people were in need now, you know, they were starving now. And uh, your eight to five wasn't gonna hack it. Members of the 352nd Special Operations Group at Rhein-Main had one idea called the triad system. 
It was used to simplify the airborne delivery of food to areas of the former Yugoslavia. Huge boxes holding individual food packages were cut open on all four sides and held together by a single band. When air crews ejected the boxes from the aircraft, the band ripped, releasing hundreds of MREs to the starving people below. From Hollywood luminaries to U.S. presidents, Rhine Mine Air Base had its share of well-known visitors. The sweetheart of the His Christmas caravan show made a memorable stop at the Gateway Theater in December of 1948. As well as serving as a stop for entertainers visiting troops serving in other parts of the world, Rhine Mine was also a favorite arrival point for many prominent American public officials. In recent years, President Jimmy Carter's visit coincided with the return of the Iranian hostages. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Bush. And President George Bush and his wife Barbara made several stops during his term in office. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Colin Powell, stopped by during the height of Desert Storm. And crowds turned out to see Vice President Al Gore and his wife Tipper during their trip to Europe. President Bill Clinton got a warm reception when he came to Rhine Mine in 1999. And President George W. Bush had to deal with the cold and the rain when he touched down in early 2005. The end of the Cold War led to an overall reduction of U.S. armed forces in Europe. In the early 90s, that reduction had a dramatic impact on Rhine-Main. In 1993, U.S. Air Force and German officials signed an agreement to return a portion of the airbase to the Frankfurt Airport. Even then, the closing of Rhine-Main Air Base was something that most people thought could never happen. It's a little hard to take. I have, I have to be perfectly honest. Um, I'm Air Force, so there isn't too many Air Force bases left here, so for me it's rather... I'm losing a part of my heart. With the various contingency operations that continued on Rhine Mine, base closure just didn't seem probable. It's really, really hard to, to believe that a place and an installation that meant so much to uh, military movement or to the military in general is finally going to be shutting its doors. However, as the years went by, the closure was not only probable, but also inevitable. By the summer of 2005, the process of shutting the base down was fully underway. One of the first landmark closures occurred far from the flight line at the Halverson Tunner School. The school was simply named the Rhine Mine Elementary School back in 1951 when it first opened for the children of military members serving on Rhine Mine Air Base. In 1986, the school was renamed for the Berlin Airlift's most famous pilot, Lieutenant Gail Halverson, and its commander, Lieutenant General William Tunner. The school's closure ceremony came at the end of the 2005 school year. The next closure was the last Sunday service at the base's chapel. For more than 50 years, the chapel was a focal point to many who traveled through the airbase. And I think one of the highlights was uh, last year when the Berlin airlifters came in here and, and they gathered in these pews and I met Gail Halverson and I was reminded of the heroism that the early uh, people of Rhine Main uh, displayed in fighting the first war, the first uh, air campaign against uh, communism. And uh, I, was, I was struck to the heart with uh, the great acts of these people. And so that tradition from the Berlin airlift to the global war on terrorism has just continued. It was also an important fixture in the lives of service members and their families who lived on base. The chapel's stained glass window memorializing the Berlin airlift was carefully removed and placed in the new passenger terminal at Ramstein Air Base. Physical pieces of the building will reside somewhere else. And so service, in a big sense, will always continue. Rhine Main is not closed or lost. Rhine Mine continues, not only in people's hearts, but in certain places. 
And that, to me, is a sense of hope. The final scheduled flight to leave Rhine Mine was a C-17 from the Mississippi Air National Guard's 172nd Airlift Wing in Jackson. The pilot and crew had been through Rhine Mine Air Base numerous times before, so being a part of the historic final flight was something they will always remember. There have been so many flights over the years, so many crews and hours of flying, and to be the last one is certainly an honor for us. The 726th Air Mobility Squadron was responsible for moving passengers and cargo at the base. The unit's airmen said their goodbyes to Rhine Mine as their mission moved to Spangdalem Air Base. On September 30th, the 469th Air Base Group's mission on Rhine Mine Air Base came to an end. The $500 million Rhine Mine Transition Program was a massively complex undertaking. The transition program was formalized in an accord worked out between the United States, the Federal Republic of Germany, the German states of Rhineland Falls and Hessen, and the Frankfurt Airport Authority. As part of the agreement, all of Rhine Main Air Base will be returned to Germany by the end of the year 2005. The expansion of the Frankfurt International Airport was the accord's driving force. In our airport master plan, uh, the land, the airbase land is uh, primarily designated for a future passenger terminal, but also some ancillary uh, facilities and operations uh, that are needed for that as well. We're now in a complicated planning approval procedure for our, our major airport expansion program. This is a 3.4 billion euro expansion program, which includes not only Terminal 3, but also a fourth runway. By 2013, most of what stood at Rhine Mine will no longer exist. The base's closure ceremony was held on October 10, 2005. U.S. Air Force and German government officials gathered for one last time to pay homage to the base's rich history. Names like Reese, Tunner, Halverson, Moore, and on and on sacrificed beyond themselves to ensure that was a successful airlift mission, the largest ever. The base will live on. As a C-17, the spirit of Rhine Mine was unveiled during the ceremonies. Another C-17, the spirit of Berlin, made one final flyby as a final salute to the celebrated airbase. Rhine Main Air Base will be sorely missed. The base's mission has been transferred to nearby Ramstein and Spangdalen Air Bases. So in reality, the job which was begun here is only just changing locations. However, the friendships which were formed at this base will stay at this base. And the gratitude of the countless thousands of lives that Rhine Main Airmen either touched or saved will be forever linked to this plot of land. Rhine Main Air Base, don't forget it. Now, our success was due in large part to all the many men and women uh, that were stationed here at uh, Rhine Mine to do the magnificent job that they did, uh, and uh, I will always remember that. I'm so pleased to be able to say, hey, I was there for that, and you can look back on that years from now, and I, it's amazing. I'm really pleased that I came here. If this space isn't remembered for anything else, uh, I think its legacy should be at least the fact that it provided so much good to so many people for so many years. And one final salute to you from your United States.
United States Air Force. Thank you and congratulations.